We've all heard it. a Christian, perhaps even an elder or a preacher, confesses some intense sin. Or maybe worse, they don't confess. They get caught. As the weeks go by, the stories multiply. We hear of the brother who rages and beats his wife. I recently heard of a man who left his wife two weeks after he was appointed to be an elder in his home congregation. He moved into an apartment he had already rented before he was appointed. And I also recently heard of an elder's wife who ran off with another woman. Stories are told of drunkenness, pornography, immorality, impropriety, vulgarity, lying, theft, even murder. And when we hear these stories, someone inevitably says, how can a Christian commit that sin? The question can come from multiple sources. Sometimes it comes from the worldly detractor who wants to highlight the supposed hypocrisy of Christians to justify avoiding the claims of Jesus. Sometimes it comes from the self-righteous Christian who hasn't committed that sin yet and wants to use the fact to prove that we are a better Christian than those people. Sometimes it comes from the Christian who has committed or been tempted by the same sin but wants to put on the mask of near perfection so no one will guess the struggle that that Christian is facing. Sometimes it comes from the well-meaning Christian who hasn't committed that particular sin, can't fathom committing it, or doesn't really know how to respond to it or to help the brother or sister face it. And sometimes it comes from the one who committed the sin as he or she searches for an explanation to how did this thing they committed to themselves, how did they do it? Why did they do it? So in this lesson, we want to talk about this idea and how do we deal with this idea of how can a Christian commit that sin? Stay tuned, please. Be sure you download the note card that goes along with this sermon and you can print it out and you can follow along, fill it in as you follow the sermon. If you like this sermon, Want to see more like this? Give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. Also hit the bell notification so you'll be notified when other new content is added to this site. We try to add sermons as often as we can. We'll try to add some Bible question and answers that we've done before in the past. Other things we may be adding to this. If you have questions, leave them in the comments below. If you'd like to follow us on social media, there are links to our social media accounts in the video description below. Now, let's jump into the sermon. We ask this question as if being baptized makes a person immune to temptation. But there really is an answer. And I'd like to, us to consider how this happens. We're actually going to have another lesson in this series, uh, Next Sunday morning, we'll, we'll ask, how can a Christian not commit that sin? And so please understand, there's not a single part of these lessons intended to teach that Christians are free to sin. And I'm not trying to excuse the sins of Christians. However, I want us to understand that Christians are not perfect people. They are forgiven and growing people. And I especially want us to be able to help those of us who have struggles with temptation and sin to know that we are in the midst of an understanding and helpful people. When we take the masks off, now I'm not talking about these COVID masks, but when we take the masks off and mid our struggles and failures, 
finding the help we need to overcome is right here. So as we look at this idea, I want us to first understand that Christians aren't immune to temptation and sin. That's the number one thing we need to understand. Christians aren't supposed to sin. Certainly that is true. But 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, I want you to notice what John says here, my little children. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But watch this next phrase. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The Bible certainly demonstrates that Christians are not immune to temptation and therefore not immune to sin. Over and over again, we can see that Peter warns Christians going back into 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. Notice, if you will, he says, For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness and after knowing it, turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallowing in the mire. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 2, verse 1 and 2, we hear about a Christian committing the sin of sexual immorality and a bunch of other Christians committing the sin of arrogance and looking the other way. Notice this now. It says it's actually reported that there is a sexual, there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not even tolerated among pagans. Here it is. For a man has his father's wife. Now that's either his mother or stepmother we're talking about there. Having sex with them, having an affair with them, however you want to say it. And he says about that verse 2, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. But perhaps the most helpful passage to us is found in Galatians chapter 2 and in verse 11. Paul says here, when Cephas, that is the apostle Peter, came to Antioch, he said, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Not that he was going to be circumcised, but fearing the Jews, what would mean there. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Now why? If the Apostle Peter was not immune to temptation and sin, why would we think we are, that our brethren will be immune? See, we're not immune. No one is immune from temptation and sin. I'm not better than you are in that regard. You're not better than me in that regard. And we don't need to be measuring ourselves by ourselves. Another thing we want to notice is this, is Satan is attacking us even harder. And so with that, we must recognize when we are baptized into Christ, Satan, as it were, paints a special target on us. Notice 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. 
He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, they're Satan. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. I remember watching Marlon Perkins and the old uh, Mutual of Omaha's United, uh, or Wild Kingdom it was, not United Kingdom, that's England. Wild Kingdom. And they would invariably show a lioness watching a flock of antelope. The antelope were so fast that the lion would never catch them, but she would watch, and eventually she would either see a crippled antelope or she would see a three-legged antelope, and that's the one she would go after because they were vulnerable. And so she was seeing that she could devour that one. Satan works like that, prowls around looking for the weak one because he knows he can devour that one. And that someone can be you. Think about it. He certainly will keep a steady supply of temptation and sin ready for those who are complicit with his will. So how much more, though, will step in up uh, when he has lost one of us, he'll step it up. Now, according to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 through 12, we're at war. Notice what he says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and put in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces in evil in the heavenly places. Christianity is not a walk in the park. It is a time on the battlefield. Goliath didn't take it, aim at all the warriors who were staying in the camp, but as soon as one walked onto the battlefield, he took special notice and made special attack. When we get baptized, we are stepping onto the battlefield and Satan will turn all of his attention on us. But I want you to know this. Christians aren't perfect. We're growing. We're to be growing. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort to supplant your faith and virtue. And he says, virtue with knowledge. Knowledge with self-control. Self-control with steadfastness. Steadfastness with godliness. Godliness with brotherly kindness. And he says, brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see that growth there? We are growing. So, what does this mean? What does this mean for us? We're growing. As long as we stay in Christ, we will be having progressive victory over sin. We will have victories we didn't have before entering Christ. But since we haven't been completely perfected yet, we will have some failures as well. Because we're growing, the very thing Satan used to capture us before we enter Christ will be there perhaps in decreasing degrees, but nevertheless, they will provide a foothold for Satan to tempt us. According to James chapter 1 and verse 14, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Notice that. Satan uses desire to tempt us. That's the beginning. Notice the rest. 
Desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. Sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. No doubt in Christ, our desires are changing to the point we will eventually say along with the psalmist that our greatest delight is the Lord himself. Psalm 73, verse 25. However, as we grow, some of those old desires linger and provide a foothold for Satan. Now, as we grow in Christ, grow in Christ, our fears will increasingly subside. However, notice what Galatians 2 and verse 12 says. He says, before certain men came, remember we read this a few minutes ago from James, talking about Peter, he was eating with Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. It demonstrates old fears can linger. He had old fears leading us into the refuge of the sins that we used to turn to in order to protect ourselves from these fears. Now, the Bible further tells us we were in the world and we're not in the world anymore. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, as 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 says, do not love the world. He said, or the things in the world. See, those things are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, here's the things in the world, the desires of the flesh, desires of the eye, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. You see, these things took us captive in sin. We developed a relationship with them prior to our obeying the gospel. In Christ, our allegiance is progressively changing. It's a change. It's not an overnight thing. It's not an overnight situa- uh, sensation. It's not a right out of the water sensation that it occurs, but it takes a while. But we have not been perfected. We've not been completed. Therefore, our friendship with them continues to pull on us. James 4, verse 4, he said, you adulterous people do not Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? You can't be friends with the world and be friends with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend with the world makes himself an enemy of God. So in the world, like Martha, we were distracted from the only necessary thing. Notice here in Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. A woman named Martha welcomed her, him into her house, and she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But notice about Martha. She was distracted with much serving. She went into him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So as we grow in Christ, our devotion to God and focus upon him will increase, yet the same distractions will catch our eyes and lead us astray at times. So please, don't misunderstand. There is a difference between those who are in Christ and those who aren't. In Christ, we are set free from our sins. We are forgiven, no longer defined by sinning, the sinning we've done. By faith in Christ, we gain the empowerment to overcome sin. We are striving to overcome sin. Those in the world are running headlong into the arms of sin. As a Christian, we're gaining progressive victory. 
as we increasingly rely on the grace of God, as we increasingly desire him above all, as we increasingly find confidence in him, as we increasingly long for heavenly things, and as we increasingly put our focus and attention on him, Satan, watch this, will win less and less. We will win more and more. But we need to understand that Christianity is a growth process. It's about progress, not perfection. Stumbling doesn't mean you aren't a Christian. Stumbling doesn't mean your brother or sister in Christ are bad Christians or wicked people. It means we are all growing Christians. So what's that say to us? It says this, quit being shocked. We shouldn't be shocked at all. When we consider this, we shouldn't really be shocked at all when a Christian commits that sin. If that was something that tempted them before they entered Christ, it will tempt them afterwards and they may stumble. And I don't want to step too much on our next lesson. Rather than being shocked that a Christian might commit that sin, we should remember that like us, they are growing and not perfect. Their sins might be different than ours, but the fact that they still sin is the same as it is for us. So unfortunately because we act like it is a crazy thing for Christians to sin. Too few of us admit it when we stumble. Instead, we hide it, cover it up, stuff it down inside where it ends up taking control and dominating us just like it did before we entered Christ. Then eventually it gets so big it can no longer be hidden. And so instead of acting like it's a crazy thing that Christians sin, we need to understand and accept that we're not immune to sin. We need to teach each other the proper response to stumbling and show some understanding so people are willing to follow that proper response. They need to know that right here is where they can find the understanding and the help they need to continue in progressive victory in Christ. And we'll talk more about how we should respond when a Christian commits that sin in our next lesson. So with that in mind, if you are one of us Christians who have committed that sin, remember what it says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, because we will, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation. That he is, he is the suitable substitute to appease the wrath of God for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now keep in mind, God hasn't given us permission to sin, but in Christ, he has given us a propitiation for our sins in Jesus Christ. So don't try to hide your sin. Bring it to him. Let him forgive you. Try as we might, we may still be shocked at what you've done. But trust me, God never is. He knew what you would do and sent Jesus to die for you. So we need to turn to him now. And how do we do that? Well, we need to understand that God, in his plan of salvation, he has done his part. What's he done? He has provided the great love of God for man. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He gave his son, Jesus Christ, as Savior. He came, Luke 19, verse 10, to seek and save the lost. And as we've been learning in our lessons on the Holy Spirit, as we've learned so far, that he sent the Holy Spirit as a guide, John 16, verse 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He gave the gospel, the power of God to salvation, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, and he provided atonement by the precious blood of Christ. Romans chapter 5, verse 19, Since therefore we, are, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So that leaves man apart. We are to hear the gospel. Romans 10, 17, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You'll know the truth, Jesus said. The truth will set you free. We must believe the gospel. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would come to God must believe he is. He's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. John said in John 20 and verse 31, These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. Then repent of your past sins. The time of this ignorance, God overlooked, now commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17, verse 30. And then with the mouth, confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father, <clears throat> which is in heaven. Then be baptized into Christ. For as many as you as were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. Acts 2 verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And then be faithful unto death, he said, and I will give you the crown of life. So, as we said in this lesson, don't be shocked when a brother or sister commits sin. We're all growing. We're all progressing in our journey to heaven. And we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who will help us. And we're here to help one another as we continue on our journey to heaven. Now, thank you for listening to this lesson. Uh, keep in mind there is a note card available for this lesson. You can find that in the description below. Uh, please subscribe to these lessons. Also, like these lessons and tell others about these lessons to come and listen to these lessons, study these lessons to help them in their walk with God.